Well, good day there, everybody. This is Joe. Hey, welcome back to the channel. I had a uh, one of these power bricks, one of these chargers for mobile devices, and this is an off-brand. I think it's the brand is called Deep Comp. And uh, anyway, the nice thing about this particular charger was it put out. It had two output ports, and it puts out 2.4 amps on each port. So a couple weeks ago, I noticed when I plugged my cable into it and plugged it into my phone that it wasn't charging. No indication of charging at all and I thought well maybe it's the cable right so I went and got a different cable and no it, same problem so it obviously was the charging block itself so I went and got my smaller charger and was starting to use that for a week or two and then I got uh, tired of the idea that this thing was broken and I couldn't fix it and so last night I decided just on the spur of the moment that I would dig into this and see if I could fix it. Now, although I haven't really done much in, in the last decade or so in terms of fixing electronics, I used to be a, a consumer electronics technician I, I, back in the 1980s and early 90s. So I was well familiar with those older kinds of uh, systems. But this was uh, different to me. I hadn't really broken into one of these charging blocks before, but what I expected to see was a switching power supply, and that is indeed what I saw. Uh, the first challenge, of course, was was to uh, open up the case and it's always a challenge with these plastic devices that aren't really designed to be opened up. So just a word of caution, I'm not advocating that you should take your charging brick and open it up and try to repair it unless you're trained and know what you're doing. There are lethal voltages inside those charging bricks even when they're unplugged, the capacitors can hold charges, especially that primary capacitor that comes off the bridge rectifier can have over 100 volts DC on it. So my advice is to uh, have a load plugged into it, have your phone or mobile phone plugged into the charging brick, unplug the brick from the wall outlet and let it discharge for a few minutes before you attempt to take it apart, okay? It is lethal. Lethal voltages could be present inside a switching power supply. Be careful. Well, okay, so the block itself, I had to pry open right here, and that, of course, caused me to mar up the external finish of the little block, but I knew that was probably one of the necessary evils in getting this apart. Once I was able to get a little room in there, this particular part right here is the uh, flip-up AC power connector, and I was able to pry open the case around that and use these flat blade screwdrivers to eventually pry the whole thing open. And uh, what I found, of course, was you have your AC connector right here, and you have two wires connecting that to the main circuit board, and the circuit board is a switching power supply. Now when the AC comes into the main circuit board from this AC connector on these two red wires, one side of it goes through this glass encapsulated fuse, and this is, this is a fuse, a safety device that will uh, open up if you have a short or an internal overcurrent in this block, and this is your main safety device for this thing, but the fuse is actually okay. I can measure the resistance of it with my meter and it measures good resistance. There it is. So the fuse is okay. That's not the problem. This is a double-sided circuit board, so you have solder connections and foil traces on one side, and you also have the same kind of foil traces and solder connections on the other side, and there are these feed-through connections that feed through between one side of the circuit board and the other. This little four pin surface mount device, this rectangular one right here, that is a full wave bridge rectifier. That is essentially four diodes arranged in a configuration where the AC comes in on these two red wires and the output is DC voltage. It's filtered by the 6.8 microfarad 400 volt capacitor, um, which the output of that is on this pin right here. It goes over to the this winding right here that's the primary winding of this transformer right here this big red transformer and so this voltage is chopped by this integrated circuit right here there's an oscillator circuit in here and there is a mosfet 
power transistor that will chop this DC voltage and create a square wave DC voltage in this winding and that creates an expanding and, and contracting magnetic field in this transformer which is coupled to this winding here and these this winding here and this winding here is the output winding. It's rectified by this big diode right here and then it's filtered by this capacitor right here to create your 5 volts DC that comes out of your USB connectors. This third winding right here is a feedback winding. The voltage out of here goes back to the integrated circuit which reads the voltage and regulates the, the duty cycle of the chopped square wave to keep this 5 volts at, at the proper voltage. So this diode is pretty big and that's because the charging block is capable of putting out 2.4 amps of current on both connectors simultaneously. So there's a fairly high current charger that's why you need a big transformer and a big diode and so that gets to the point of when you're looking at these charging blocks, USB outputs, uh, they all have 5 volts output, that's the USB standard, but the amount of current that they put out will determine how fast it'll charge your phone. The more current it puts out, the faster it'll charge. This is an Apple charger and it only puts out one amp of current, so it takes a lot longer to charge uh, through this connector or this USB block. And you can see from the size difference between the circuit in this dual output charger versus the Apple charger that the Apple charger has a lot smaller transformer and probably not as big of a uh, rectifier diode and all that it's just not built for the current output that this one is so again the bigger charging blocks are going to give you more current and faster charging so it's a switching power supply and these kinds of circuits have several commonly known faults and historically what I've seen in power supplies like this there are two general issues you'll find one of those is bad solder connections so you'll have solder connections that have cracks on them oftentimes this will happen around components that have a lot of physical stress and such as for instance transformers are heavy and if this block is moved around bounced around and tossed around it could vibrate this heavy part which could cause some of the solder connections to crack on the circuit board well I've inspected these connections and there's no cracks on the transformer the other thing that can happen is you have these output connectors where you plug your USB cable into and those have a lot of stress because of the way people plug cables in and bend them a little bit and the metal shield around the outside of the connector solders uh, on two different places on the circuit board to kind of anchor the connector and make them pretty solid but you still want to check the solder connections here uh, to make sure there's no cracks on them and they are okay um, the other problem I've seen with power supplies in general are these electrolytic capacitors. Uh, a capacitor is essentially two conductive plates that are spaced closely together and in between them you have a dielectric material. And in the case of electrolytic capacitors they have an electrolyte paste as the uh, dielectric. And the problem with these capacitors is over time, over the years, especially if the capacitors are situated next to a warm or hot component that gives off heat this electrolyte paste will dry out and it'll cause the value of the capacitor to drop and also it'll develop a, an internal series resistance in the capacitor so it, it effectively starts to become a, a series RC circuit instead of just a pure capacitor and it effectively starts uh, changing the circuit properties of the circuit that it's in until the circuit doesn't work anymore. This uh, power supply has three electrolytic capacitors, these two here and this one here. This electrolytic capacitor is a thousand microfarads at 10 volts and that's the filter capacitor for the output, the 5 volt rectifier diode. This capacitor is 6.8 microfarads at 400 volts. That's the filter capacitor for the output DC of the bridge rectifier. And this small capacitor is 4.7 microfarads at 50 volts. And this filters a small DC voltage coming off the, the secondary winding that gives feedback 
back to the integrated circuit as to how much voltage the uh, circuit is producing. So I don't expect these electrolytic capacitors to be bad just because I haven't had this charging block for that long. So I don't expect it to have uh, worn out and to dried out the capacitors. And also there's not really that many heat generating components in here. The bridge rectifier gets a little warm. The integrated circuit will, but mainly because it has the power MOSFET switching transistor in it. But this is not really a heat generating circuit at this low wattage of a device. So um, my main suspicion is really about solder connections. And so what I started to do here is to make some resistance checks. So you can do this with a fancy digital voltmeter or you can use a really simple little um, analog type of meter and I have this set on resistance here. So I'm going to measure the terminals here. Well first of all you have this rotating uh, kind of AC plug and that is suspicious right because you have rotating parts, moving parts maybe it's a problem so I'm going to ohm this out from the terminal jack to where this red wire goes and it looks like it is good. Now if I measure the other plug to this wire, it has no continuity. It's open. And now if I measure up to here, it has good continuity. But over here it doesn't. So there's an open between here and here on this wire. Well, if I inspect the solder connection right here, it looks good and the wire doesn't look broken or pinched, but when I look right at this solder connection right here, look what I find. There's a split, a crack, right in the middle of this solder connection on this terminal. I can make it come and go based on how hard I press on it, but basically there is no con continuity between one side and the other. The nice thing about these old um, solder stations is it doesn't take too long for the tip to warm up. Yes, that side and the other side, both of them. Of course the real test is going to be putting it back together and seeing if it charges. Okay, well, I want to see if I can put it back together. So the two connectors obviously face the opening in the box. The circuit board fits nicely down in here like that. And then the AC connector bracket, there's a little slot right here that it fits in. And I've kind of boogered up this side of it to try to pry it open. So now, it's just a matter of, I might end up having to tape or glue this back together just to keep it together. I don't know if it'll hold together. Hey, it actually holds together. Well, it doesn't look too bad. There's a little bit of marring here from when I tried to pry this open. Well, I did. I succeeded in prying it open, but... So the only way to actually test whether or not this thing works is to plug it in and find out. So we're going to, first of all, plug it into an extension cord here. And then get our nice little braided blue cable and plug it into my phone. Hey, it's charging. It senses it and it's charging. Yay, it works. Yeehaw! Woohoo! And it's already gone from 85% to 86% in less than a minute. So, hey, this thing is working fantastic. Well, you know, um, when you have a problem like this, it's not working, you don't really know what you're going to find. It could have been something unfixable. It could have been a defect in that little integrated circuit or something burned out that I can't easily get a replacement for or whatever. But it turned out to be one of the most common problems you have in electronics, especially power supplies, is bad solder connections. It's good to have a little temperature controlled solder station that you can use to fix that. Uh, I've been using this particular Weller solder station since the 1980s. They don't make these anymore, I don't think.
I don't know if you, even wellers in business, they probably are. But anyway, so it has a base station and it has this solder pencil that is um, temperature control. There's a, a thermal magnetic switch in the barrel of this solder station and it opens and closes to maintain temperature. So you can hear it clicking on and off. Uh, as it's reg regulating the temperature. This is not an adjustable temperature station. You essentially have to change out the tips. You unscrew this collar and you put different size tips on it to get different th uh, thermal uh, different properties. Um, the main thing about these though, since I've had this station since I think the last time I used it professionally was in the early 90s, but I've been using it for hobby use ever since then. So that's been what, 30 years or so. Um, but I always, re-coat the tip with fresh solder before I turn it off and that keeps it from corroding and so it keeps it in good shape. It is kind of cool. I have the original sponge <laughs> that I used when this thing was brand new and that's kind of fun. But anyway, it's nice to have tools that you use for decades and decades, but hey, it's fun fixing something as mundane and simple as a charging block. Uh, my iPhone came with this little one amp Apple charger, but it really is nice to have the higher current dual connector charger of this Deep Comp brand. And there's a bunch of different brands of these chargers out there. Anyways, this is Joe Van Cleve with just a little electronic fix for you. Fixing a charging brick for a mobile device. I did it. Yay. I don't have to go out and spend money to buy a new one, right? If you have any thoughts or comments, drop them down below. I'd love to read them. And until next time, Stay creative and have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye for now.